Hi everyone. Our topic today is temperature effects in integrated circuits. What's real? My name is Dave and our featured speaker today is Adi Srinivasan, who heads up thermal analysis at Gradient. Adi, are you ready to get started? Sure, let's get going. Adi, the topic today is temperature, specifically IC temperature. We've all seen temperature plots of chips, usually including the package and even the board. Is there more to it than that? I mean, what's going on here? Dave, you do often see coarse temperature profiles like this one, and they can be useful for package or system design. But the temperature profile of the die is so coarse that the temperature doesn't vary much in a small area. This can happen when the power profile of the chip is coarse, or is averaged to simplify the simulation. The resolution of IR thermography is around 10 microns, and an IR picture can look a lot like this plot. But in reality, the power in a chip is dissipated by individual transistors or other devices that are much smaller than 10 microns. At each new technology node, the heat sources shrink and are packed closer together. For at least 10 years, industrial and academic labs have used several methods to directly measure the temperature across individual transistors, and those temperature variations happen on a much finer scale than this plot. Adi, let's get real. What's one real effect of temperature in integrated circuits? Dave, we know that temperature increases result in degraded performance and device failure. Let's look at reliability. As you'd expect, it's the worst case, or peak temperature, that limits the lifetime of a current carrying device. Reliability engineers are familiar with the so-called bathtub curve that shows the failure rate of semiconductor chips versus time. A product goes to an initial infant mortality period where the failure rate is high. The majority of parts will have a useful life with a failure rate set by the expected mean time between failures, or MTBF. After that, the failure rate increases again during the wear-out period. Increased temperature has two effects. It shortens the average useful life of chips since the wear-out period occurs sooner. And within this shorter lifetime, the bathtub floor is higher, which means that the failure rate is higher too. Raising the peak temperature of transistors and wires significantly reduces a chip's life. Adi, just how significant is this? How much does temperature really affect chip reliability? Well, a slightly hotter transistor has a much shorter life. An increase of around 10 degrees C in junction temperature shortens its life by around 50%. If the temperature increases due to a pulsed waveform, you need to know the frequency and duration of the temperature peaks to accurately calculate the expected lifetime. To identify the least reliable transistors or wires, you need to know where, how often, and for how long each temperature peak lasts at the length scales of the devices. Adi, I know there are tools that simulate temperature. I bet most of the folks on this call today know someone at their company who's doing some sort of temperature simulation, probably in the packaging group. Yes, for chips, but not at the length scales of devices, which we need for lifetime prediction, or to annotate your SPICE simulations on a per-device basis. Package scale tools at their highest resolutions cannot resolve large numbers of transistors. A typical package simulation would obscure details below a few tens of microns. For a package simulation tool, the picture on the left would be considered high resolution. On the right, we repeated the simulation, resolving both power and layout geometries down to submicron detail. To quantify the reliability hazards we described earlier, we need temperatures at the length scales of transistors or wires throughout the die. The peak temperatures vary across individual devices. Looking at the figure on the right, I see a lot of peaks. What's happening there? You mean those spiky temperature peaks that look like trees on a hill? Each spike is the local temperature increase due to an individual wire or transistor. The hill is due to the combined effects of heat sources clustered at one end of the chip. So you're seeing the temperature due to self-heating, as well as the collected effects of heat sources on each other. That's a very different profile than the one on the left which you were calling the coarse temperature results. Yes, the difference in detail means that you would report two very different temperatures for a given transistor in the two cases. So you'd also predict very different lifetimes for that transistor. So those package level simulations, like the one on the left, are useful for understanding the heat flow in and out of a package. But if you need to know what's going on at the device or wire level, then you need something different. Yes, that's right. Adi, most of the images or plots that I've seen look like the package scale image here on the left. How do we know these device scale temperature differences really exist? Those coarse images usually result from traditional infrared thermography, which has a diffraction-limited resolution of around 7 microns at best. 
We know temperature variations exist at a finer scale than 7 microns because temperature differences of 20 degrees C within a micron have been measured using a variety of methods. For example, thermography based on Raman backscattering usually resolves temperature variations within a micron and within a nanosecond in time. At the University of Bristol, Raman thermography measurements were made on a compound semiconductor power transistor dissipating about a watt. The measured temperature difference between the center of the transistor gate and the adjacent source or drain 2.5 microns away was well over 50 degrees C. The same measurements showed sub-200 nanosecond responses to rising or falling powers, followed by slower responses on the scale of 10 microseconds to 200 microseconds, depending on the device substrates. You mentioned these measurements were made on a compound semiconductor chip. How about CMOS? Researchers at IBM's T.J. Watson Research Center at Yorktown Heights used photon emission microscopy to count time-resolved single photons with sub-nanosecond accuracy. They continuously pulsed an N-fed gate in a 180 nanometer bulk CMOS process and measured a junction temperature about 60 degrees C above the ambient with a thermal time constant of about 60 nanoseconds. In a 180 nanometer SOI process, they also measured junction temperatures near 100 degrees Celsius above ambient, with a thermal time constant around 100 nanoseconds. The insulating effect of the Barrett oxide layer causes SOI temperatures to be higher and to change more slowly than in the bulk CMOS case. Adi, how significant are these device level temperature variations, and can we simulate them? The measurements at IBM and at Bristol showed that temperature can exceed 50 degrees C across a single gate in as little as 100 nanoseconds. But we've also seen that small temperature differences like 5 to 10 degrees C can greatly reduce device or wire lifetimes. Small temperature differences also result in mismatched devices or non-uniform drive strength in a power transistor. All these effects can be simulated when you collect and use the relevant details. Adi, are you saying we can actually simulate device level temperature? What do we need to do that accurately? We can simulate device level temperature. Full chip simulations resolving individual transistor temperatures have been directly verified using thermography and indirectly verified using electrical measurements. To accurately simulate device temperatures, you need power values and layout geometries at the length scales of the power sources, namely the devices such as transistors or wires. You also need accurate boundary conditions for the die. The fine grain details then need to be modeled and solved in a simulator that preserves these details and includes the effects of microscale heat transport. You need to model power and layout details that are usually ignored in coarse simulations. So, can you give us a real world example of this? Sure. At On Semiconductor, accurate circuit simulation of this multi trenched MOS power transistor required knowledge of its temperature. You can see in this photograph that the core power transistor is surrounded by termination trenches and isolation trenches that thermally insulate the heat source. We're going to see how ignoring or simplifying the thermal effect of these structures causes significant errors. Here's a closer view of one finger of the vertical MOS transistor. Power is dissipated in the red vertical channel. The vertical gates are the green poly cuboids. Here's a view of four fingers of the vertical transistor. There are 15 fingers like this in a pocket that is surrounded on all four sides by an isolation trench, and there are three such pockets. So each finger will have a distinct temperature and drive current because of its unique position in the array. Let's look more closely at the trenches. They act as insulating blankets that increase the temperature of each transistor. To simulate the effects of both types of trenches, each heat source must be modeled in three dimensions. The poly regions and gate trenches filled with oxide need to be accurately modeled, as do the deeper isolation trenches. This plot shows the results of simulating pulse powers at three different power levels, with the red curves representing accurately modeled trenches and the blue curves representing the case where trenches were ignored. Ignoring trenches results in a dangerous underestimation of temperature, where the error is as high as 10 degrees C for the 8 watt case. This plot shows both temperature measurements and electrothermal simulation results when the power pulses are short. And this plot shows the results when power pulses are longer. You can see excellent agreement between measurements made using transient interferometry and thermal simulation results. The smooth plot on the right and the surface plot on the left show the temperature in the plane below the gate at a time of 100 milliseconds for the 1.2 watt case. The underestimation error of 10 degrees C you would get by ignoring trenches 
would lead you to overestimate device lifetime by about a hundred percent, as we saw earlier. So it's critical to model layout details like the gate and isolation trenches in a thermal simulation. That's really interesting. You just showed us how underestimating temperature can lead us to an overestimate of lifetime. But can you help me improve my design's performance during circuit design or reduce respins? Yes, if the transistors and other devices in your net list were individually annotated with their accurate temperatures, your circuit simulation results would be very different than your results using constant temperature. The temperature-aware circuit simulation results allow you to compensate for the effect of temperature mismatches in your design and to quantify the effect of changes in layout. In this design, a bipolar power transistor has a non-uniform power distribution because some fingers are closer to the power supply pads than others. But how large is this non-uniformity in the power distribution? A typical approach to answering this question would be to make measurements on test structures. Designers would add voltage and current probe points as well as temperature sensors to the layout. They would then measure current, voltage, and temperature and perhaps confirm the temperatures using infrared or other thermal imaging methods. But this approach can be replaced by an electrothermal simulation. Let me get this straight. You can replace measured currents and voltages with values from a thermally aware circuit simulation? Yes. Here's the data from probe points around the PNP power transistor. The measured sweeps of collector current and base emitter voltage versus base current are shown in the solid blue and purple curves. The device is segmented into unit cells, which are extracted into the circuit simulation netlist. Each unit cell is then annotated with a distinct temperature. We can then run an electrothermal simulation, where a circuit simulator like Spectre or SPICE computes power per unit cell. A thermal solver uses these power values to compute and annotate temperature per unit cell back into the circuit simulation. We repeat this loop until the currents, voltages, and temperatures converge. The dashed lines in this plot show the collector current and base emitter voltage from this thermally aware circuit simulation, and their values match the measured values in the smooth curves. This plot shows the measured voltage drop along the metal lines on the y-axis versus distance from the emitter on the x-axis. The values computed by electrothermal simulation are again very close. Let's look at the temperature measurements. These three-dimensional electrothermal simulation results show non-uniform temperature and power. The thermal simulation also agrees with the results of transient interferometry and infrared thermography. So, if the electrothermal simulation matches the IR and interferometry results, can I use it before tape-out? Yes, running an electrothermal simulation before tape-out would allow you to modify the power routing and produce a more uniform power dissipation. That way, you could see the thermal and electrical effects of each layout change. So we need accurate temperatures for accurate circuit simulation of the power transistor. This avoids respins and enables design optimization before tape-out. Reliability or functionality analysis clearly require accurate temperature simulation for those analog power designs. But is high-resolution thermal simulation useful when the temperature variations are smaller, as in digital designs? It can be. Even in analog designs, smaller temperature variations are often significant, especially where designers need device matching. As we'll see in the next segment, identifying unreliable wire segments in a high-performance digital design requires accurate knowledge of small temperature differences. A recent paper from Advanced Micro Devices at a conference on device reliability shows how important accurate three-dimensional thermal simulation is in reliability estimation. Thermal simulation of a design block resolved the temperature on 4.5 million power sources, including wire segments. The detailed temperatures they produced were used for signal electromigration analysis, which identifies unreliable wire segments in vias. A few minutes ago, we looked at how a small temperature increase could significantly reduce device lifetime. A paper on wire self-heating by Chen Minghu notes that at room temperature, a temperature increase of 8 degrees C reduces an aluminum wire's lifetime by about 50%. So we need accurate wire and via temperatures to estimate their lifetimes. In the AMD paper, temperatures were measured in electromigration test structures. This plot shows the difference between simulated and measured temperatures. The measured temperatures are well correlated with the simulation results, as you can see. The simulator resolves the temperatures of individual wire segments and vias. As we now know, an increase of a few degrees C in wire temperatures significantly reduces wire lifetimes, so accurate predictions of wire lifetime require accurate wire temperatures.
I see how we can use electrothermal simulation to improve reliability analysis and improve performance in analog mixed signal or digital designs. But how about more extreme failures? Can we electrothermally simulate effects such as device breakdown? It is possible. Designers have simulated breakdown under extreme powers, such as the 7 kilowatt spike in our next design. The device models that you use in circuit simulation need to be able to handle such extreme conditions. A recent paper from On Semiconductor at the Semitherm Conference shows how to simulate the avalanche breakdown of a multi-trenched vertical MOS transistor under unclamped inductive switching conditions. This top view of the chip shows a power MOSFET in the yellow region with surrounding termination rings in green. Previously, breakdown was difficult if not impossible to simulate with any accuracy for several reasons. First, breakdown power is dissipated both in the transistor core below the semiconductor surface and in the termination rings at the semiconductor surface. Each region has a significant thickness, which is a problem for many thermal simulators that prefer to model heat sources as flat, two-dimensional regions. The second obstacle to accurate simulation is the huge initial power spike during breakdown. In this case, the magnitude of the power spike is around 7500 watts. Many simulators can't converge with such high powers, especially at tiny length scales. The final obstacle is that layout details need to be modeled, as we saw in our first design where the effects of trenches were so significant. Air gaps, gate trenches, and oxide plugs are micro-scale layout details that most thermal simulators ignore or smooth out by averaging. Using the appropriate tools, designers were able to overcome these obstacles, resulting in a new approach to the electrothermal simulation of breakdown as described in this paper. Transistor breakdown IV characteristics depend strongly on temperature both in the core device of the power transistor and in the termination rings. The engineers at On Semiconductor ran a TCAD simulation of this temperature dependence to build an analog behavioral model of the power transistor and the termination rings. The behavioral model is usable in a circuit simulator like Spectre. The designers at On Semiconductor then used a full chip thermal simulator capable of handling the disparate 3D heat sources air gaps, trenches, and 7 kilowatt power level to calculate temperature. This temperature was read by a transient circuit simulation. With accurate temperatures and temperature dependent device models, the temperatures and voltages in the power transistor were simulated during breakdown. This plot shows the simulated temperature in the transistor and in the termination rings. Since the termination region is smaller than the transistor, it heats up and cools down faster during breakdown. We're going to see simulation results in two important planes within the chip, in the regions where power is dissipated. The lower plane is in the region where the core transistor dissipates power, and the upper plane is in the area where the termination rings dissipate power. This movie shows two plots, where both height and color represent temperature varying in time. The plot on the right displays temperature in the termination rings. Deeper below the silicon surface, the plot at left shows temperature in the core transistor. How accurate were the circuit simulation results once you used the simulated temperatures? Breakdown voltage, which depends strongly on temperature, was measured over time. The electrothermal simulation included a circuit simulation that produced plots of voltage versus time. This plot shows the simulation results, together with the measured voltage, during the inductive power spike that caused breakdown. As you see, the two curves are very close. So, by using tools capable of modeling the power and layout in detail, and capable of handling large and fast power spikes, we can overcome the current obstacles to accurate breakdown simulation. The accurate electrothermal simulation of breakdown in a power transistor improves estimates of reliability and robustness. Since this occurs before tape out, designers can avoid costly respins. What thermal simulation tools were used in the reliability, optimization, electromigration, and breakdown analyses that we've seen? For each design problem, the thermal simulator used was Heatwave from Gradient. In each case, Heatwave read the most detailed power and layout data available, together with a thermal model of the die boundary and the thermal properties of materials within the chip, like the metals, vias, and transistors. Heatwave computed temperature at the length scales of the layout geometries and power sources, and annotated temperature into circuit simulation. Well, how does that last step work, annotating the Heatwave results into circuit simulation? Heatwave reads the powers computed by a circuit simulator and then computes temperature on each instance in the circuit simulation netlist. The circuit simulation is rerun at the new temperatures, producing new power values for each instance. This process is repeated until there is essentially no change in temperature or power.
So in the first design, we saw that the thermal effects of isolation trenches were critical. In the second, we quantified the non-uniformity of power and temperature due to routing. In the third case, Heatwave computed the individual wire segment and via temperatures needed for signal electromigration analysis. Finally, Heatwave modeled large power spikes and detailed layout to electrothermally simulate avalanche breakdown. Adi, let me recap what we've talked about today. First, we looked at the fact that significant device scale temperature differences really do exist. You showed us this measurement of a delta T of 90 degrees C across a single transistor. Next, you showed us how Heatwave accurately simulates these device level temperature differences, and we talked about how essential accuracy is for predicting reliability. We also saw how relatively small simplifications of details can cause serious errors. We saw how Heatwave improves the accuracy of the circuit simulators we're using now by annotating accurate device-specific temperatures into the netlist and iterating until voltage, current, and temperature converge. Finally, we learned how Heatwave's detailed thermal simulations were essential to the reliability, performance, electromigration, and breakdown analyses that you showed us.